Well, very simple title for today's message is Fruit, Fellowship, and Faith. Uh, like I said, first service only got through verse number eight. They only dealt with the fruit aspect, but uh, perhaps we'll get through fellowship and faith in this service. I don't know. Um, I want to I want to I want to take us back and, and let us remember here that as we come to the book of Romans that last week was introductory weekend and uh, you know God gave us a lot in introductory weekend he you know we, we saw the foundation and that foundation being upon the work of Jesus Christ and then we saw that that Paul the Apostle he was called and that from that call that there was uh, you know a response of his life of being separated to God separated to the gospel separated to do as God had called him to do. And then we saw that there was power, you know, that the, the power, the demonstration of power, that the proof was through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the message that Paul gave. And then we saw that as he, he wrapped himself down in verse five, six, seven, that, that there was this grace for obedience. And as we start our time here today, before we dive into the aspects of fruit, I wanna remind you once and again that God has given us grace for obedience that the super overwhelming, transforming grace of Jesus Christ present in our lives is enough for us to live a successful, a powerful, a pleasing, and an enjoyable Christian life. It is by God's grace, grace for obedience that we've been given. Well, Paul writes, he says in verse number seven, he says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God and called to be saints, Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He magnifies it. In case he didn't get it, he was addressing to who the letter is going. And, and, and I find it very interesting. This wasn't to, you know, the masses in Rome. This was very specifically to the saints. To the saints that were in Rome. Well, where did these saints come from? How did they get there? Because none of the apostles had been there. Paul, the, Paul himself had never been there. You know, and, and so where did these saints come from? Well, scholars tell us this, and we know that as we read through the book of Acts, by the time we come to chapter two and the, the start and the birth of the church, that we remember Pentecost was going on and the falling of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church, and, and Peter stands up amongst the saints and he gives a message, and some 3,000 people are converted. And remember, in Jerusalem at this, at this time, at Pentecost, there was people from all over the world that were there. People had flooded in from all across the Roman Empire and, and, and maybe even into the Far East and everything had come. And as he gives the message, the Holy Spirit falls in such a capacity that 3,000 lives are surrendered to Jesus Christ. The feast ends and people return to their own town, their own city. Well, scholars tell us that from that, there, there was a movement of people and, and people invariably went back to Rome. It wasn't a lot of people that we were dealing with that got saved. I mean, a lot in one setting, 3,000. I mean, we'd love to see that happen here, man. I think we'd jump out of our chair and go, revival has hit, baby. <laughs> but, but, but that's what it was. And people were dispersed. And some of these Christians went back to Rome. Now, uh, as we said last week, we know that Romans, that, that this is the gospel according to God or the gospel according to grace. And what Paul magnifies in the aspect of good doctrine is it brings inspiration, is it brings renewal. And gang, that's why we have diverted back into this book for us as a fellowship. We've been going through the Gospel of John. We've seen the life and the work of Jesus Christ. And, and as, as, as the Apostle John presents the life and the work of Jesus Christ in his Gospel, it's not like the Synoptic Gospels. It was different. And we'll get back to it. But we saw the Son of God in a very powerful way and the way that he spoke to much of the conditions of the religious people was very straight and very straight, and very direct. And if you were here, as we covered the first eight chapters of that, some of that we sense by way of tone within here is like, oh man, the Lord's being serious. And over time, things have an impact upon us. And so uh, by way of prompting, uh, I believe it was the Lord that planted the thought within my mind for the benefit of us as a fellowship, we have diverted back into, or we diverted over to Romans, that we, that we might catch a, a refreshing and a renewal of, of that wonderful inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we might not forget that indeed that this is all about the gospel according to grace, not the gospel, not a, not a gospel according to, to works. No, it's about God's grace. Well, this book of Romans here when we set it to the backdrop of the times and we began to extract out 
historically what was going on in Rome at this time. Paul wrote this somewhere between late 56 AD and, and maybe even as far as uh, 58 AD, but somewhere in that year and a half span of time frame there. And when he, he, when he penned this, he was writing from down in the area over in the area of Corinth in and around there. And as he shared this, again, he'd never been to Rome, but he understood the cultural tones that were going on in Rome. He understood that there was a, a, a number of believers there, few in number, but that the impact that they had was enough to where their faith and to where their reputation, uh, reputation and the fruit that was coming out of their lives was impacting a cold and a dark society. We live in a cold and a dark society right now. In Rome, for the elite living there in Rome, was, it was awesome. You had culture of arts. You had theater, you had, uh, you know, uh, a, a wonderful new city out there on the, the expanding western frontier and all of this stuff. And it, it was awesome, you know. All roads led to Rome and all roads Paul knew would lead out of Rome and, and, and all of these things about Rome. And so for the elite, living in Rome with a population of about a million people at that time was an awesome thing. They dug it. But half of that population, half of the one million people in Rome, half of them were slaves. And the condition for the lower class, scholars say, and when we begin to look at biblical history and all that, that they lived a life that was very tough. Now, this is not too far from our understanding because when we began to think about a downtown environment, let's just think about for Denver downtown for just a moment. We know that in Denver downtown that we've got wonderful high-rise places there where we have wealthier people that live. I mean, it costs a lot of money to get into some of those houses or some of those condos, I should say. But we also know that, that in and around the surrounding of the metropolis of, of some of the more wealthy stuff, that we've also got laced in there a whole ton of poverty that is throughout Denver. And the struggle that, that, that comes from the poverty living in our very own downtown was some of the same types of things that were attached in Rome at that time, that the lower class people struggled. And, and, and re it's remarkable because they actually had these uh, multi-story living complexes. You know, you and I would call them again, you know, uh, uh, maybe apartments today, but they had these same types of things. And the, and, and the big struggle that made it difficult was is that the basic commodities as it pertains to um, water, uh, you know, s uh, sewer by way of sanitation and all of that stuff, that they did not have pumps and all that stuff to raise up these things into the upper floors of these multi-story units. And so dirting, uh, living became very dirty and difficult. And in these areas for the lower class, not only was the commodities of sanitation a struggle, but also the aspect of food. And so from the overflow of that, you would get a lot of crime that would happen. So these believers lived in this condition. Now, if we want to set on top of that, the Christian community. Most of the time in the Christian community, when a, a member of a family would come to faith in Christ, that they would get expelled from their family, that the family would, would push off of them. And F.F. F. Bruce tells us this, that at that time, that the name or the title that Christians took on in Rome is this, is that the culture called them enemies of the human race. Enemies of the human race. They had this label that was slapped upon the top of them. And, and, and I don't know how well you are with labels, but maybe I can take this and I can, I can drill this down in such a way that you're capturing the essence of it. It's going to be a little bit of extreme, and in, in fact, it's only going to get more extreme as we move into the next week or two, because, because Paul deals with the wrath of God being uh, unveiled from heaven against the secular man, the man that lives as though there is no God and does what he wants. In our time, in this era of time, and the calamity of stuff that is happening, we have this thing that is coming across as a wave upon all fronts of our society, medical education, our kids' school, and the church is getting bombarded with it as well. Gender dysphoria. 
If you don't know the term, well, well, we'll be looking at it in a few weeks. But understanding that those that are wrestling with this aspect of gender identity as we stand in 2018, and, and, and for you or me or anybody else from the medical community to the education field to, to, to the, um, I'm going to say religion as a whole, I don't just mean Christi, Christianity, but religions. If anybody stands up and says that this is wrong and that these things um, you know, are, are clearly not so, that you're, you're squelched and you're pushed back and you're labeled with the term as being hateful, as being not understanding, as being unsympathetic and all these things. And all these titles are put down. And what does it do? It silences the church of Jesus Christ and, and as opposed to standing up for what God has done and for walking in and distributing the grace of God, we become anchored down and hunkered down in this bunker type setting, if you will, and we become inward with our faith instead of outward with our faith. In Rome, they were labeled as enemies of the human race because of the things in which they stood for. Now, you may experience this stuff within your very own family. You know, I shared something personally with First Service, and I'll share it again right now with you guys. That, that, that what goes on in this sanctuary is recorded, and right now it's being live broadcast around the globe. You can see in the hallway the stats from last month, the month of June, in terms of what happened. The hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of numbers of what is going on with legitimately people tuning in is far greater than, than those of you that sit here in this sanctuary today. There's an impact. And with that impact, I have members of my family, distant family that is watching in and some people are being encouraged and built up in Jesus. And I also have other members of my family that are on the hunt for me because they hate me, because they despise me, because they're watching to try to trip me up, and because they want to throw rocks at me in some capacity. And that's no hyperbole. It's not an exaggeration. My family is watching on in some, in some conditions. It's disgusting. I've talked super fast. Maybe that's because I want to get farther. I want to get beyond one verse in this study. <laughs> I just realized how fast I was talking. Oh, man, that's my San Diego coming out in me, I guess. That West Coast maneuvering or something. I don't know. <laughs> but those in Rome, the Christians, they were known as enemies of the human race. But I think it says something about our faith. Well, we're not always spoken well of by people, that people that oppose us. We know that Jesus has told us that in this world that we're going to have persecution. We're going to suffer setbacks and trials and struggles. But he said to be of good cheer because he's overcome. As we find ourselves in verse number eight here, I put a, a simple point on this is fruit. And before Paul begins to explain the Christian doctrine, he takes just a moment, maybe even just a verse, and he encourages the believers. And when we understand the backdrop of what they were living in, boy, we can really understand that surely they needed a word of encouragement. They needed somebody in their corner to believe in them. And Paul did that. He acknowledged their fruitfulness. Verse 8, one more time. He says, first, as he's beginning to address them, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Listen, their faith was, was lived out publicly. And even though there was public pressure, they, they continued to remain in a place to where they, they were um, responsive to what Jesus has done. And if you get nothing, out, nothing else out of this study as we go through Romans, through this entire book, I hope that you, that you got a sense of it last week. And I'm going to underscore it this week. And most likely I'll underscore it every single week. This is all about the grace of God. And when we understand the grace of God, our lives are rearranged for his purposes. How so? How so? Well, Paul magnifies and will continue to magnify all of the transformative works of God that, that yes, we are a new creation in Christ, but that new creation only opens us up to live in the fullness, to live in the abundance of, of a life that is filled and lived with and by and through His grace. We become sensitive 
in the aspect of submitting ourselves unto the Lord. And I can go on a bit of a tangent right here at this, at this point, and, and I don't mean to soapbox it, but I, but I gotta tell you, man, I've walked with Jesus for 26 years. That's not a lot, a lot of time, but I've lived more of my life as a Christian than I have as not a Christian. And I have found that God has transformed me over the course of these years of my walk. And I've had some bad years where, where, where Jesus was just doing a work of changing me and trial and struggle and all that stuff. But his transformative grace never left me. And he hasn't left me to this particular moment. And what I've seen along the path, not only is pastoring, but in lay ministry. Remember, I've been pastoring for less than seven years. I mean, when this church started, it was me and my family. I mean, it was home, de home devos. We didn't even have to leave home really to do church, if you will, okay? That's just how it was. Uh, side note, uh, side note right there. I remember this is what I wanted to tell you earlier during announcements time, but uh, um, some people ask, hey, why don't, we, why, don't, why don't we just do a single service here? You know, this, this, the sanctuary can hold 200 chairs. Why don't we just do a single service? Well, uh, one, because we never know who's going to come out, okay? And, and two, it's really because of the children's ministry. Uh, children's ministry was jacked up last week because of all the traffic of kids and then the struggle with help and all of these things. And so, um, anyways, um, by show of hands, uh, who in here is a parent? Anybody a parent? Even if your kids are not in children's ministry, raise your hands if that applies to you. Okay, look around the room, please. Keep your hands up. Don't be shy. I'm not calling you to walk the aisle. Don't worry. Don't be all weird. Okay, you see this? Okay, you can put your hands down. Uh, what, what am I magnifying right now? There ain't no reason that we need to put an announcement up for volunteers for children's ministry. You know, it's there. And once you understand the transformative work of God and that wonderful grace of God, your life is rearranged. And if that becomes a struggle for you, then guess what? The problem is a heart problem. The problem is, is that you don't understand. And thus we are back in the, in the uh, gospel according to grace. Romans, right? Uh, that we might capture an understanding. Listen. Gang, you and I are, 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 are to submit to the wonderful works of Jesus himself, not because we want to be religious, but because we understand what he's done. And Romans gives those Christians in Rome, and you and I today in 2018, it gives us the basis and the heartbeat of Jesus so that we realize what we do with our lives, that, that, we, that we realize and the soapbox aspect that I talk about is this. I've had people in my circle of influence for decades. I've had people in my own family for decades. Well-meaning people that are Christians that, that continue to arrange their lives around them. These Christians in Rome were stinking dirt poor. And God cared for them. Wait a minute, Pastor. You're getting too close to my life. Wait a minute, Pastor, you're calling me out personally. No, I'm not. If that applies to you personally, well, praise God. You're in this service. You weren't in the first service, and we talked about it then, okay? But here's the point. What are you going to carry into eternity with you that you're going to gain from structuring your life around your desires, your agenda, your work, your schooling, your vacations, your kids. What, what, what are you going to carry into eternity when you structure your life around that? I, I, I have seen so many people over the course of these 26 years, personal friends, again, by way of being in the ministry and all that stuff, is that there's always an excuse as to why the aspect of full engagement with Jesus in the body of a local fellowship is something that is skipped and missed and put on the back burner. I've heard it time and again. It's come out of my family. Not my household, but my family. And I've seen the devastation and what, what, what it's brought. And then it motivates, it seems like invariably, it always motivates a working of the flesh to try to conjure up some outside ministry to do this and to do that and to do all these things. And yet, the very first place, Christians, hear my heart on this. Actually, hear the scriptures on this. Forget what my heart has to say. Well, my, my, my heart is, is that you wouldn't waste your time, but the scripture aspect in, the, in the, uh, the full counsel of God as we're dealing with it, primarily New Testament here, is that the arranging of our lives 
is first around Jesus. It's first around God. The secondary issues that come up from there, while it might not strike a popular curve within your heart, it's only because we have forgotten what it's like to be a servant. What is a servant? These folks that were in Rome, half of them there, were, they were part of the lower class. Paul was ministering, he'll later tell us in, in, in verse number 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God. Why was he speaking that? Because the elite within that society, the other half of society, that they look down upon, wait a minute, you're placing your trust and giving your life up for what? A dude, a carpenter that died on the cross as a poor man? I don't know if they had crack back in those days, but you're smoking something weird then is the deal, okay? That's the idea. That, that really is the idea front and center. And we begin to preach that in the church of Jesus Christ today from the pulpit, all of a sudden it becomes as an affront and assault to us. Well, who's this pastor? Who does he think that he can talk to me like that? Well, first off, I'm nobody. I'm a servant. Second off, from that servanthood, I don't bring my own message. But when there's things that are legitimately happening in the Christian community today and, we, and we've got so much of, of the wave of our society is pushing back with, with the use of all these things that, that hurt people. You know, our state, you know, uh, it, it, with this, this, this marijuana thing. I, I'm not on a marijuana trip right now. I'm on, a, I'm on a trip for hurting lives. And lives are dulled and people are, are, are sequestered in this transgender stuff and, and, and all the, this transgender dysphoria, dysphoria stuff that is happening right now is, is, is going all the way down to the age of about five, six years old. They're starting off very young and saying that they've got to be educated just in case that they, you know, they're not this and they're not that. We want to make sure that they identify with who they are. Listen, God created a man and woman, male and female. In the story, done. And for those that are wrestling and those that are trapped, this is not a, man, I don't, I don't want to stand on a pound the pulpit moment because listen, these are the very people that need the transformative grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. But you know who's going to give it to them? God has set the institution of the church there to go. And God is working supernaturally by the power of his Holy Spirit to empower individual believers to be his witness. And when the church is so worried about the arrangement of their own individual lives, I've got to earn this money, I've got to do that, and this can't inconvenience me, and all of these particular things, the focus has moved and has shifted, and the fruitfulness of our life and the abiding factor that we are to abide in Christ and his word within us is moved. And we try to go out and we try to be Lone Ranger Christians. Well, I'm just going to live a great life and people are going to ask me questions. Great. But the gospel never transferred by your silence. God raised up men and women to preach, to teach, to give the word. You must speak. It is great to have a moral life and may you continue to have a moral life. But he uses instruments. And the Holy Spirit, or God the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit, he has chosen to use the frailty of man Men and women. And that's the, that's the body of Christ when the church was birthed in the book of Acts. And we stand here today. And our, our mission is not for bigger building bodies and budgets. Our mission is for, is for sharing freedom with those that are living in fear. F sharing freedom and grace and hope and forgiveness with families that are shattered. Our time is not to be spent casting our pearl before the swine, before all those people that just want to argue over the aspect of, of nuances and, 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 and getting into this, you know, parsing the tenses and this and all that stuff. Listen, all of that stuff does is create battles. We're not wise if we do it. But the love of Jesus Christ has been demonstrated. And as we learned last week, that when we keep our face towards the Lord, that whether it's your first day or it's your 100th year walking with God, you're in the right spot because you're walking with God. And the fruit of these guys' life that was coming out of Rome, that God was doing something powerful in them. I'm hesitant to share this with you because of, of uh, I just, I'm afraid I just don't have the, 
opportunity to develop the fullness of it, but I'll take you there anyways. Ezekiel 47. And so if my time is short there, please understand it's, it's not the main focus of our study, so I'm not going to totally exegete it in its context. But I'm going to give you an application very simply. The same thing that made the, uh, that, that brought the birth of the church in the book of Acts. The same thing. Mm. The same thing that, uh, that you and I need today is the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing that we find in Ezekiel 47 as a major prophet. That is this Ezekiel the prophet that the angel was taking him and showing him. 47 and 1 it says, Then behold, or then he uh, brought me back to the door of the temple. And there was water flowing from under the, th the threshold of the temple toward the east from the front of the temple, from the front of the temple faced the east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. Listen, this is, this is a, I mean, if we could, if we could shape this uh, vision or this picture here into New Testament language, we, we, we would just nothing more than, than talk about the, the super abundance, overflowing supply of God's presence for those that are devoted to God. And from that super supply of God's Holy Spirit, not only pouring into our lives, but flowing out of our lives, there is a natural sequence or a natural process. Verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, right here in this, is to where we find that Ezekiel, that he was, he was told to measure these things, is in this vision, and then this angel took him deeper. And that flow of water that was coming out of the sanctuary came up to his ankles and it went down to his knees and it went, it filled up to his waist and then it was all the way here in the, in the middle of verse number five to which it was so much that he had to swim in it. And gang, I, I want you to know this morning that the super overwhelming supply of God's grace is there to not only envelop you, to raise you, to pick you up, but to carry you. The question comes is, will we, uh, will we embrace what God has done? You can flip back to, to Romans. Will we embrace what God has done? Listen, God brings times of trial. He brings times of testing. And I want to encourage you to look at trial and testing. We're not speaking about the chastening hand of God, but the trials and the testing. That these struggles that God allows to happen in our life, it's because it's his very fingerprints of grace that are upon our life that we're in those things. It's his fingerprints that are on us. We know that he's the one that restores our soul and there's nobody else that can do it. We know that in the poetic fashion of Psalm 23, verse number four is, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not gonna fear no evil because your rod and your staff are with me. And we know that, that when we look at Psalm 23 through the, through the eyes of a shepherd, we know that what the shepherd has to do to get to that flat top is what they would call it, the flat top, the perches on top in the upper portions of the mountain region. The flat top is where the, the good green grass would go. But the shepherd would have to go there first at the forefront of the sheep to pull out all the toxic weeds that are there so, so the sheep didn't get sick. But on the journey to this place of well eating, the struggle of what they had to do, and this is where the poetic phrase comes in, as though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, speaks about going down into such a narrow gorge to where the walls are so straight up and the, and, and, and the walls of this gorge that they're traveling through to get to the flat top, that the, that the light of sun is blocked out and it becomes shadows. That's the trial. That's the testings within our life. And God wants us to hang on so that we can get to the flat top to where the healthy, nutritious stuff is because he's taking us through these things to set us in green pastures. He's taking us through because he's the only one that restores our soul. In Romans, and what Paul gives here is he lays all of this stuff out, but he doesn't shy away from talking about the elements of sin that are there. But the main focus always comes back to the transformative grace of God. I, 
I don't know everybody in this fellowship. That sounds weird because I'm the pastor, but I just don't. I don't know everybody in this room. But I know so many of you, and I know that there are many of you that have gone through such serious trials within your life, such big struggles, so many of you. And the rich stories that you have about God's grace on the other side are beautiful. And I know that in this fellowship, because of the, uh, the, the people that come to the Lord and the people that are come in that are broken and in, in, in all the, the ways that God works, I know that there are people here that are yet to navigate into deep water because they're hesitant to lay their life down. But the tragedy that I find, and it exists in this church among some, is that there are people that have gone through these deep gorges and these deep valleys and they have forgotten the lessons that God has brought them. They have forgotten the lessons that God has ministered to them in these tough times. And the way that we know this to be truth is because the person, the people, those that are unaffected or unchanged by the grace of God they're saved, but there's a wasted life that is going on. And we know this to be the case because it's, it's business as usual. It's life unchanged. Following Jesus is good, but it's challenging and it's inconvenient and it's not a popular message in our time. And it's a message that God is still giving and it's all throughout his scriptures. And the reason that we fear the trials and the reason that we fear the times of testing, might it be because we fear God himself? M might it be because we're afraid to draw close to the Lord because we know that God wants to work those things out of our life? Might it be because we realize that if I draw close to God, he's going to rearrange this? Paul knew. And he says, man, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. I've done this here one time before and I'm going to do it again this morning. I'm going to preface this. I do not mean any offense, and this is not for condemnation purposes. It's none of that. But it is to illustrate something real. And the reason I'm on my knees right here, I'm not on my knees to pray. I'm just on my knees here so I can see you in your eyeballs. Okay? If you take and weigh and measure your life over the course of the past three months, you as ambassadors of Christ. How many people outside the four walls of the church have you spoken to about Jesus? How many people have you brought to church with you? How many people have you led to faith? Well, wait a minute, Pastor. You're getting a little too personal there. Listen, I'm not asking you to respond. It's not, you're not my servant. <laughs> I'm not asking you this question to, to, to bring more people to church. Well, it's summertime. The tithes must be down. Pastor wants more people. No. It's not my church. It's Jesus' church. And I'm a co-laborer with you. But in co-laboring with you, the reality of the gospel message as it's spoken and the light of God's word as it shines down, his transformative grace upon our life and we recognize that we're laying down and we're responding as servants and we've been given the beautiful title of, of ambassadors of Christ that we're on mission for Jesus. And yet the church at large, I hope it's not us as a fellowship, but the church at large, Big C, the church has moved into a time of apostasy to when we speak these simple things and, and it's like we're trying to grab hold of this gospel message or the message that comes out of the New Testament from the gospels, Romans, epistles, etc. And it's like, dude, this is such foreign language to me. The reason it's foreign language is because we no longer live that way. 
These guys were dependent upon the Lord to bring them food because their family had alienated them, because they were in lower class living conditions, because the aspect of water and sanitation to be able to flush the toilet and all that stuff, there's not the conditions that were there. And they wrestled with these things. In America, and in 2018, for us as Christians, the commodities and the things in which we have, we take them for granted, and all of this stuff has rocked us to sleep, and we become ineffective in our Christian walk with the Lord. Now, that's not the primary purpose of our Christian walk, is effectiveness. The primary thing is, is that we would enjoy Jesus. But a healthy enjoyment of Jesus brings a natural fruit, and this is what Paul is speaking of in verse number 8 that they enjoyed this relationship and the relationship was fruitful and the fruit of that was evidenced and demonstrated. Now, if that convicts you here this morning or condemns you here this morning, shake it off. My wife would say to our our kids, suck it up, cupcake. (laughs) That's when she gives them something tough, okay? So if that's the aspect that it's falling upon you today, I would tell you, suck it up, cupcake, because you're not hearing the message. If you're convicted over that, convicted. Remember the difference. Condemnation causes your heart to go, who is that guy? How can he say that to me? Conviction goes, God, forgive me. Lord, forgive me, for I've sinned against you. If you've been convicted, then praise the Lord. Perhaps you've been stirred up to love and good works as Peter told us to do. (laughs) And by the way, we're to do it all the more as we see the day approaching. What's the day? As we recognize the conditions that Christ is returning. We're to do it all the more. Why? So that we be shaken out of our sleep, so that we can dust off the apathy, so that we can return to the place and the spot of abiding in the fullness of what Jesus has done and we'd have that vibrant life, not because of what we do, but because of who he is. The transformative grace that spills over us. And listen, if you want to empty a church out, bring that message. And if that was the only message that was given, shame, shame. But it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes our lives. And we understand what he's done. We're changed. Listen, most of you know I'm in the middle of these health challenges. What has it done for me on the inside? I I, I get self-conscious sometimes because of of the physiological responses that happen and you wonder why I, I scurry out of conversations with you quickly. It's not you, it's me. But one thing for sure that is done on the inside of me is it's brought a new element of brokenness before Jesus And the brokenness has also created within me an overwhelming boldness to say, oh no, oh no. God would have us to speak. God would have us to share. God would have us to experience his great love. God would have this for us. I think I might end it right here so I can keep you close with first service. (laughs) <laughs> stinking first service what's wrong with those guys <laughs> but I want to tell you maybe I could share a phrase or so because this really hit me with where I'm at in my life right now I'm going to read it to you and I'll explain it as believers in Jesus Christ we hand carry the gospel message we hand carry the message procure yourself which is the only cure for the deadly disease of sin. And if our lives remain unchanged by the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, and we're unchanged as we hear the simple teaching of his word, then there will be those people that die alone in their sin. Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 17 to 21. I encourage you to read that on your own. Ezekiel was the watchman on the wall, and he was the share, and he was the towel. God has saved you that he might bring you into the fullness of his grace. But he has saved you not to set you up on a shelf in a china shop to be a, a, you know, this specimen of beauty, and there you are on your holy perch. God has saved you to use you that you would get dirty 
that you'd get down in the highways and the byways of where people are living and there you would share your faith. And I want to share a story with you that is a real story. It happened last week. That there was a group of eight people after service. They were hanging around for an extended amount of time and they invited me to go out to, to eat some food with them and I went. It was grand. I had a good time. It's been a while since I've been out fellowshipping in that capacity and while we were at this restaurant, we were there eating uh, breakfast. So, by the way, this restaurant serves breakfast until 2 o'clock. They specifically serve the church community for those hours. Love it. If you want to know the name, hit me up at the door. I'll tell you. I'm not going to broadcast it here. But while we were there, there was this, a woman that was attached to our group that was there, um, you know, some person in this fellowship. And I, I don't know exactly what happened, but this, this gal gets in a conversation with one of the waiters or something, and uh, you know, she learns that uh, the owner of the store wasn't, the owner of the restaurant wasn't there this, this day, Sunday, because three days prior she had this um, heart attack type, cardiac arrest is the right word. Her heart stopped beating and she stopped breathing. And, and her husband and, and kids, they had to revive her right there in their house. And this gal, she says, oh, can we pray for her? And the person says, yes, hang on just a second. And they go out into the front room, did whatever they did, and the next thing you know, this gal comes back. Now we're in a restaurant, a public setting. Somebody in our little fellowship group right there, a gal says, can we pray? And this woman comes back and begins to share the story. And our little table raises hands, and we begin to pray for her. And it touched this woman's life. And come to find out, the chick's already a Christian. She was encouraged by it. We don't know what God's going to do. But the reason that I magnify the story for you is this. And I was so proud of this individual. Because it's the simple acts of faith that Jesus is calling us to. That when we're in the normal chorus of our business, it's not standing up there and debating in a theological aspect, but it's looking at somebody and say, you know what, Jesus loves you. What's your name? Can I pray for you? A very simple response. And when somebody is hurting and they hear that spoken to them, you capture their attention. Because our world is a cold and a callous place where the movement and the speed of what goes on here, that there's no time. No time to hear the, the pitfalls of somebody else. I've got to get on to my appointment. And we look at... We look at the gathering of the saints in the same capacity. I'll tell you the same thing I tell you every summer. Build Jesus into your summer. If you're going out, go on mission. If you've got to take a vacation, have fun. If you're gone the entire summer, dude, what the heck are you doing? Seriously? We got, we got silly announcements up here that are saying that we need people in the children's ministry. What are you doing? And that's the part that would be suck it up, cupcake, okay? I hope you hear that part. All right? Listen, Jesus is coming back. And when, we, when, when the message of the cross resonates within our heart, the response of a pure heart and a clean conscience of recognizing what Jesus has done, yes, it spills be, beyond the, the realm of our little world. My job, my school, my family, my thing. Listen, you can't be a part of something you're not in. You can't be a part of something that you don't show up to. You can't be, and this message is, is, is it, it, it's not for one, it's for all of us. Hear the heart of, of God. Hear the plain teaching of the scriptures. And my hope and my prayer is, is that once we get beyond these first three chapters of Paul dealing with the aspects of introduction and then he goes head long front and center bam he he confronts the aspect of sin the secular man the self-righteous man the religious man once we get beyond that he begins to unpackage what God has done and I hope that you can hang on because I know that when you get through and when we get through Romans that our faith is going to be substantially different than what it is right now because we're going to be built up on our most holy faith, as the scripture says. And we will understand 
from a fresh and a new perspective, the inspiration and the renewal. It's not about coming to a fellowship and working harder. It is about receiving all that God has for you and realizing that the trials and the temptations and the troubles and the adversity, that these are the mere presence of God's fingerprints upon our life because we're walking in the right direction. And as we walk in the right direction, the difficulties bring us that much more closer to him and to each other, and we abide in him. May we not lose the lessons that we are learning as we walk through the valley of the shadow of darkness. But may these become permanent imprints and stains upon our heart that we know and we are thoroughly convinced and because we know and because we're thoroughly convinced that the response is is that we're laying our lives down because there was a readiness in Paul's life and that readiness led to him really right at the Damascus Road conversion. What do you want me to do, Lord? And that's the right response to the gospel message. May God bless you guys. May God hold you. May God strengthen you. May we as a church, as a fellowship, may we understand the days in which we live in. May it cause us to cling to Jesus so much more. Will you stand with me? Let us pray. Thanks for joining us today. If you want to know more about having a real relationship with God, click the Do You Know Him link at westminstercalvary.org. We also would like to invite you to join us for our regular weekly services on Sundays at 8.30 and 10 a.m. or Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are conveniently located on the northeast corner of Wadsworth Parkway and Church Ranch Boulevard in the Stanley Lake Marketplace Shopping Center. For more information, please contact our church offices at 303-223-4640. Thanks and God bless. Oh